my name is Viral Nayak. Uh, my background is actually banking. So I spent 24 years in banking, uh, working with Citi, JP Morgan, Barclays, and uh, Bank of America. And then since last two years, I decided to join the other side. <laughs> so I've been with Ripple for last two years, uh, and it's been really an interesting time. Uh, and I just want to share some of the things that, uh, and the vision that we would, and I think before we get onto the use cases, it's good to understand the vision that we all want to achieve, and then use cases make sense. And vision's always grand, right? Vision's ul ultimately what you want to achieve, and it's not easy to achieve. It requires a lot of steps. So we hope that efforts of everyone else in the industry and some of these events will lead to some of the steps which are going to be groundbreaking to change and achieve the vision. Okay. So just a very quick word about Ripple. It was founded in 2012. Uh, we've got uh, now, I think, more than 300 employees. Uh, we are, uh, as you can see, quite a few cities in the world now. Um, uh, the company headquarters in San Francisco, but uh, London's the biggest office outside San Francisco, and we've got a permanent office here with you know, 45, 50 staff. Um, so what we do is we provide um, blockchain-based uh, solutions for cross-border payments, as it says. But uh, we'll talk a little bit. I mean, I've got some resources later on, but hopefully most of you would have heard about something called XRP. If not, um, you know, uh, you can get interested later on. Uh, but we got not just a cryptocurrency, but we got a blockchain platform. Uh, we participated in something called Interledger, which is an industry-wide body and a solution. And we also have a platform which uh, does smart contracts. Um, okay. So uh, vision, and the way I would introduce the vision is internet of value. Um, and I'm just going to walk through a few steps to, you know, introduce the concept, what we mean by internet of value. So this is how shipping used to be. So, you know, uh, old times, ships, all the, all the goods had to be loaded manually, and it was slow. Then came a groundbreaking concept. Actually, it was just a container. And, and that changed the industry. Just by you know such a simple change, but with container, you know the whole global trade and movements uh, change, and it it rose exponentially. Today, if you look at it uh, in global financial transactions, just look at the number of companies and global companies which sell in multiple countries, and what this means is that there's so much global transactions and need for financial transactions that need to happen. So as an example, Amazon, 100 plus countries today, sending orders to 185 countries, 1 billion items in 2015. It's probably a few billion items now. All of them require payments. The sellers are in a different country sometimes than the buyers. Um, requires financial transactions to make this happen. So. The other thing which is happening is internet, internet is not just connecting people, but things as well. Internet of things. We all connected, uh, and it's continued to increase. How many devices are connected on internet is just increasing exponentially. So what do these need? They need the right infrastructure to support and sustain growth. So the transaction volumes are going quite high. The trend is everybody wants immediate transaction ideally. You know, I don't want to wait to be paid. I want this uh, now, and I want to pay it now, and I want the money to reach so that I can get my items quickly. Uh, I want to pay as much as I need. I don't want to bulk it up to, you know, bigger payments. You know, if it is $5, then I just want to pay $5. Why should I, you know, bulk it up to $100 and wait for $100 worth? And uh, people don't want failures. I mean, I, I want to make sure it happens. You know, I don't have to chase it, and, and I should know it's happened and done. But what does happen traditionally? Uh, traditionally, particularly if you're sending any money across the countries, it takes time. It's slow. It can take up to two to three days, actually, to send money from you know, one continent to another. Every leg that is there, there are potential for delays and settlement risk, things going wrong. 
So this is where blockchain comes into play. Uh, it does revolutionize how transactions are recorded. So if you look at the basic technology, essentially it changes how they are recorded. Can we use it uh, to, to make a difference? We can, but then at the same time, we can't put the whole world on one blockchain. It would be great if we could have one blockchain, but that's just not realistic or feasible. So we have to look at blockchain and beyond blockchain. And what we mean by that is, you know, you have a number of different networks. There's a domestic clearing networks, you have blockchain networks, you have card networks. So the question is, how, how can you connect it all up? And if we did that, that would be really good. You can just send payment from one to another seamlessly, and that would be wonderful. So what, what, what we want to do is ultimately, not we want, but just industry and, and the consumers and the millennials you know, today, they want reduced cost. They want, to, they want a new cost structure. You know, if I want to make small payments, and it, you know, it's easy to make small payments inside the country in the same currency, but it, you know, it's not that easy if you want to make across the border. And particularly when you're buying things off internet across countries, why can't it be as as easy to do small value payments. Um, service payment to exotic corridors without being in the country. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of, you know, there are a lot of services that happen today. So for example, um, there's freelance, you know, um, people working in a number of different countries for US companies. And now all these US companies don't want to be in all those countries, but they want to pay them in those countries. So uh, where it comes to is ultimately we are looking at it as we want to move money in the same fashion as information moves on internet. So why can't money move in the same way? And that's what we mean by internet of value as against just information. How can you transfer value in the same way the information transfers? And if we achieve that, there are a number of use cases. And it's not just payments, it's lending, Capital markets, securities, trade finance, all of, all of these places, the core is it requires movement of value, be it money, be it an underlying credit uh, that you're passing through or some other instrument. So that's what we think and that's the vision as I said. I think as again, it's a, it's a grand vision. It's not easy to achieve. Uh, but you know we can all we can do is you know take steps towards it, and you know at some day there's going to be enough critical mass to have this happen because internet itself did not happen in one day; it took time. So with that as a context, um, I'll talk about use cases. Um, so we've given a few use cases to get your thinking going, but again, this is not to restrict your thinking. If you if you you know, the broad area is decentralized finance and blockchain related, but, you know, be creative, feel free to, you know, uh, what, what you think is a good idea and makes a difference. So the first I would say is micropayments. Um, and I think I did touch upon it earlier, but, you know, why can't I get paid every hour? You know, particularly if I'm not an employee, I'm a contract worker, why do I need to wait to you know, then submit my time sheet or time sheet, invoice it, get the money. I have to reconcile it. So there's a lot of overhead. Why can't it be pay as you go? You know, I've done work. Get me money every hour. So that's that's one of the things. Again, like Uber, Uber driver, minicab drivers, they don't get paid uh, at the same time. They get paid later on. And why can't they be paid at the same time? Things like, you know, if uh, something I won in a gaming, in one gaming platform, you know, I want, you know, to get, for, I want to have that in my wallet so that I can use it somewhere else immediately. Now, typically, the pain point is the cost of making transaction is higher. And, and or either the cost or it's cumbersome to make the transaction and that's why people bunch it up and it's, it's, a, it's a lower frequency and higher value transactions. 
but this is flipping it and saying that you know pay as you go you know, advertising revenue every click you know get it paid maybe it's few cents maybe it's few pence you know let 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 the payment come through so um, so this is the first one i think this is where how could it be done i think there are a lot of uh, underlying technologies which are available um, so wallets digital wallets digital assets like cryptocurrencies you can have smart contracts to you know basically automatically do the payments so this is this is how do you bring it all together to you know create certain use cases to showcase what could be done here this is uh, the second one is uh, real time liquidity optimization and what i mean I'll, I'll explain this is this is more related to all all the financial institutions which make payments and for making payments they require money and to make payments in number of different countries they need to keep money in number of different countries in different currencies so if i am a, a payment provider money service provider which is making in 10 countries i need to have pockets of currency in those all those 10 countries and if i if i run out of that money and i can't make payments and i can't easily put money into that it takes 2 3 days to put money to money to get there which means i have to forecast in advance 3 days or 2 days in advance how much money i'm going to need to make my payments and typically what happens is i will create more buffer because i'm not so sure you know depends on my customers you know how much flow i'm going to get um so there's more money kept on which i'm not it cost me i'm not earning any interest and it's expensive so there is an estimate that there's about you know almost like a few trillion dollars in a lot of what we call nostra accounts which are you know accounts that banks and money service providers use that's the value kind of value which is locked up all over the world and if there was a smarter way to either predict it or move the money quicker or just in time moving things or using a bridging currency to say i'm going to hold all my in dollars for if i'm in a us company and i'll if i need philippine pesos when i want to make payment i can get it fairly quickly right so if that were to be possible then the cost goes down and how does consumer benefit out of this if this cost goes down the cost of the transactions less and consumers will be charged less too so that's the second use case now for this we will provide a set uh, a data set which gives you a typical banks transactions and uh, balances say so it, it, it be an example set uh, identity and compliance this is another big pain point in terms of payments um different countries have different requirements uh in terms of how you identify how do you identify account uh to make the payment there are additional requirements so that they can do compliance check that this is not a sanction list this person is not on sanction list there's also fraud potential in a lot of cases you know and we had this in uk right where you know solid email gets trapped and the account number gets changed uh and you end up paying somebody that you really didn't intend to pay um so uh what i mean by issues payments get stuck can go to a wrong place or can get returned after a few days so you sent it but it takes a few days before you know that oh okay it can't be delivered because something was wrong with it uh you lost time uh and that times money and you probably haven't got something back so uh what would be ideal idea will be if there'll be some simple way of aliasing or everybody can reference something simple which points to a list of information which requires the payment to be made and all the parties who are involved in the payment chain can access it unauthorized person should not be allowed but the authorized person for people in the chain of payments can access that and it becomes simple and straight forward so that it reduces significantly the error uh and ensures the payment goes to the right place now uh this is where how it could be done i think uh, blockchain's got a lot of uh, applicability in terms of you know sort of identity and ensuring it for aliasing there could be number of different schemes qr codes some some people use mobile phone numbers or something else and then i think the permissioning aspect is important because you you don't want anybody to get this information right so um that's something that you you need to take a look at 
the other, the next one is interoperability. So we've got you know number of uh, different blockchain networks itself, and then on top of that, we've got car networks. Um, we've got you know domestic payment networks. Um, I'm, I think for this, what I would say is ultimately we want to try and see how can you move money from one wallet. It doesn't matter whether the wallet is you know, uh, with particular one blockchain or it is with one provider, but you know, one wallet to any other wallet in the world. Okay. Um, I think this is where Interledger might come into play uh, and then uh, any other bridging networks protocols and use of digital assets as a bridging currency potentially, you know, can, can make a difference to get payment from one wallet to another wallet uh, seamlessly. So decentralized finance is a big area uh, and applicability is not just in payments. Um, as you can see, um, there are a number of different financial disciplines where you could apply similar concept. And when we mean by this, what we mean by decentralized is reduction of intermediaries, use of networks and protocols to exchange value. So it could be settlement of equity trades, you know, um, uh, that's 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 there too, or or trade exchanging of uh, trade documents and payments uh, for import and export. So uh, anything which removes central party and having to go through a typical exchange, uh, leading to one more step, one more set of costs instead of you know through a network, through an established set of protocols, make it happen. There's a lot going on in this space. This is some, just some examples. In each of these areas, you can see there are a number of startups, companies doing some work. Uh, it's a busy area. So the ask to you really is create your own use case. Pick anything that you like. It, as long as it's decentralized finance, you're using the principles, and it is within the financial discipline. You know, Pick something that's close to you, that's some good idea that you have, and you think it's going to make a significant difference. Uh, just wanted to introduce some other resources. I'll be very quick, but uh, this is Ripple supports, uh, has a program called Xpring, Xpring.io. You can go to the website uh, and you'll find certain things that you can, and it's not just, you just don't have to use this. You can use Ethereum based backbone if you wanted to choose, if you want to do that, up to you. Uh, the main difference is that we, uh, we will bring some engineers and developers during the hackathon to help you if you're going to use any one of these technologies. Okay. Um, this just shows that, you know, in terms of how does the digital asset that Ripple has XRP compares with others in terms of speed it takes, in terms of cost and throughput. So the whole genesis of XRP which was done, which came after Bitcoin and everything, was to basically enable high level of throughput. So if, if, you, if something was to become a global you know, transaction currencies, it would require a significantly high throughput than what Bitcoin can provide today. Uh, and so you might want to take a look at that. Uh, Interledger pro project itself, uh, there's an interledger.org, I think, is the, is the uh, uh, website. But it's an open protocol. Uh, there's a community group, and there are, as you can see, there are you know number of contributors to it, including banks, central banks, payment companies, and consulting companies. Um, so uh, it, it has got a working prototype as well. And the last uh, is uh, uh, something called Codius, which is uh, scalable smart contracts built on top of Interledger protocol. Okay. You can find all of this information on xspring.io. Uh, and you can use similar technology from other Ethereum, Hyperledger, um, whatever you want to use. This is one of the options. Um, up to you which one you want to use. That brings to my presentation. Thank you.